Hello, I'm Max Rudin, president and publisher of Library of America, and welcome to LOA Live. Library of America is a nonprofit organization dedicated to publishing authoritative new volumes of great American writers and to keeping the many voiced American literary tradition a vital part of our culture. A special welcome to Library of America fellows and members who support our mission. 2022 is Library of America's 40th anniversary year. We're celebrating it with special events like this one. Please check our website, LOA.org, for details on future events. Tonight, for a special edition of LOA Live, we welcome Maxine Hong Kingston. Her work is published this month in a new Library of America collection, The Woman Warrior, Chinaman, Tripmaster Monkey, and Other Writings, volume number 355 in the Library of America series, edited by novelist Viet Thanh Nguyen, who also joins us uh, tonight. Publication support for the Library of America Kingston edition was provided by a gift from Elana Eng Lim, her husband Randy Lim, and their sons Justin and Jordan Lim, in memory of Elana's grandmother, Al Shi Eng, who was born in 1899 in Chulin Village in the Sunwoi District of China and who died in Seattle, Washington in 1981. The volume is available for endowment through the Guardians of American Letters Fund to keep it permanently in print. For details, please visit LOA.org support. Special thanks to our partners for this evening's program, Asia Society, Asian America Arts Alliance, Asian American Writers Workshop, the Association of Literary Scholars, Critics, and Writers, the International Women's Writers Guild, Writing Guild, excuse me, Singapore Unbound, the University of Southern California English Department, the Writers Guild Foundation, and You and Me Books. Beginning with her 1976 debut, The Woman Warrior, subtitled Memoirs of a Childhood Among Ghosts, Maxine Hong Kingston's audacious and imaginative storytelling transformed American autobiography, the American family memoir, and American writing more broadly, along the way, claiming Asian American history and experience for American literature, and opening a path for the many writers who have followed her. Kwa Shu wrote in The New Yorker, the woman warrior changed American culture. For those who understood where Kingston was coming from, it was encouragement that they could tell stories too. For those who didn't, the woman warrior became the definitive telling of the Asian immigrant experience. We're incredibly fortunate to have her with us tonight, uh, joining, I think, from the Bay Area. Uh, she, can, she can confirm that. Uh, we're also incredibly fortunate to be joined tonight by one of those writers who understood, the editor of the LOA edition of her work, once her student at Berkeley, now a colleague and friend. Viet Thanh Huyen is author of the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Sympathizer. His other works include The Refugees, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War, and Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America. He is Errol Arnold Chair of English and Professor of English, American Studies and Ethnicity and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. He joins us from Los Angeles. A reminder that we invite your questions and comments. The Q&A button is on your menu bar. Please let us know where you're viewing from. Now, uh, I'm honored uh, and extremely delighted to welcome Maxine Han Kingston and Viet Thanh Nguyen. Thanks so much, Max, for that introduction. Uh, hello, Maxine, it's good to see you again. Yes, hello. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is the second of three conversations I'm doing with Maxine in honor of this Library of America volume about her work. Three conversations is probably not enough. Um, so it's really just a delight to be here with you. As, as Max said, I'm your uh, former student, but I think once someone is a student, they're a student always, which means I may be hitting you up for a letter of recommendation sometime soon. Oh, well, of course. <laughs> Uh, it's awesome to be here with you. Um, well, I don't know if you want to say anything in, in advance, but I know you're going to be reading a few lines from your work. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
first of all, I want to thank you. I thank all the readers and the Library of America for this, this chance for me in my old age to uh, look over uh, my lifetime of work. But especially I want to thank our sponsors, the Lynn family and the Ng family. I, if I had time right now, I would tell the myth of the Lim Well, in our dialect, we say Lum, and uh, we owe you because you saved our lives a thousand years ago. And uh, there's a whole history of that. And uh, there is, uh, yeah. and our family made a vow that we will always carry your shoes. So, and here you come into my life now, incarnations later, and, uh, and giving me a place in the Library of America. So thank you. And as for the Ng family, we're, we're related. My, uh, my great uncle, the River Pirate, and my, uh, my grandmother, are also so here we are connecting again uh, many lives later okay what I want to do is uh, read you uh, some breakthrough sentences and uh, these are uh, they're only a sentence long but what happened was that it it broke uh, through, uh, uh, broke through my own uh, writing and also to readers. Okay, the first sentence is this. You must not tell anyone, my mother said, what I am about to tell you. Okay, so, so my mother put a kapu, a taboo on my writing. So don't tell any of this. And, um, and so what I did, I just quoted her stricture against, against whatever I had to say. And the very next sentence, I blab everything. And, uh, and I continued doing that. And it just seemed to open the doors. What it is, is that I defied her and I'm rebellious and uh, I, I, I think that that is a necessity for writers to, to be rebels and to be defiant. And uh, so after writing that sentence, there's a whole lifetime of books that opened up. And I, I told family secrets, including our illegal immigration. I wrote history that has not been written in history books. And I broke uh, uh, rules of form and content. Okay, just a, a no, uh, next page, just a very two pages later, I wrote this. Chinese Americans, when you try to understand what things in you are Chinese, how do you separate what is peculiar to childhood, to poverty, insanities, one family, your mother who marked your growing with stories from what is Chinese? What is Chinese tradition and what is the movies? I, I picked this, uh, uh, these two sentences because it was Viet that pointed them out to me that uh, that I actually chose and addressed who my readers would be. And, uh, 
talking to Chinese Americans and, uh, and other readers can just listen in. Okay, then the, and this is also in the woman warrior, uh, the, the next chapter of the woman warrior. I, uh, I, I, I wrote a sentence that I, I have uh, gotten a picture. Somebody, there's a library in Washington state, I think. They've taken this sentence and, and put it in the front of, of the library on the outside of the building. I learn to make my mind large as the universe is large so that there is room for paradoxes. At the very end of the next chapter, in, in which I write, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I write like a Kung Fu movie. And, uh, and in Kung Fu movies, there's always this revenge. Somebody does something horrible and everybody else is, is uh, getting revenge. And uh, there's a, a lot of uh, violence and fighting. And uh, so I thought of another way to get revenge. Is it possible for, uh, for a writer to write uh, nonviolent action. The idioms for revenge are report a crime and report to five families. The reporting is the vengeance, not the beheading, not the gutting, but the words. Okay, so as a writer, I figured out a way that I can uh, uh, I can uh, be part of uh, of a war and a battle, but be nonviolent. And the way to do it is to write. Uh, okay, then in China, men. Here's a sentence that I I feel very happy about in China men, and uh, that is, it, it's, a, it's a, a vision I have that everything is interrelated. All of us are related. And, uh, and this is also scientific because we're, this is about the ecology of the earth. Men build bridges and streets when there is already an amazing gold electric ring connecting every living being as surely as if we held hands, flippers and paws, feelers and wings. Okay, in, in, at the beginning of China Men, uh, I address my father. This is in the same way that I talk to Chinese Americans. Now, I am talking to my father uh, directly, and he is a, uh, uh, he's a very silent man. And uh, so, so this is what I say to him. I take after Mama. We have peasant minds. We see a stranger's tick and ascribe motives. I'll tell you what I suppose from your silences and few words, and you can tell me that I'm mistaken. You'll just have to speak up with the real stories if I've got you wrong. Okay, and here is uh, the last sentence of uh, Tripmaster Monkey. And um, this is, in this last sentence, I address all Americans. 
and I call you Americans a name. Dear American monkey, don't be afraid. Here, let us tweak your ear and kiss your other ear. And now I'm reading the last sentence of uh, the fifth book of peace. And uh, this is, uh, this, the, the, it's actually a, a couple of sentences, but it's become a meme. This is on the internet now. It's, uh, the images of peace are ephemeral. The language of peace is subtle. The reasons for peace, the definitions of peace, the very idea of peace have to be invented and invented again. Children, everybody. Oh, here, I, I, and again, I'm addressing specific people uh, that are readers, children, everybody. Here's what to do during war. In a time of destruction, create something, a poem, a parade, a friendship, a community, a place that is the commons, a school, a vow, a moral principle, one peaceful moment. Thank you, Maxine. Um, the quotations that you had remind me. Oh, Viet, I can't hear you. Really? Uh, now I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. okay. Gotcha. So I'll, I'll repeat myself. I, I, Maxine, your, your, uh, your sentences remind me of why you have the stature as being one of our great American writers, um, both in terms of your artistic power, but also your moral and political vision as well, which has helped to steer both Asian American literature, but also uh, American literature as well. Well, um, over the past several decades. And all the quotations that you picked from The Woman Warrior, I've actually taught whenever I teach The Woman Warrior. So we're thinking along the same wavelength. And as you mentioned, I've actually quoted from the, uh, a couple of those passages in my own work. And recently I gave a commencement speech at a college at Franklin Marshall College. And I quoted a different thing, a different passage from The Woman Warrior, which you didn't read, which is the passage about necessity and extravagance. And that's been a very influential passage because two of my professors at UC Berkeley quoted that, Ronald Takaki and Strangers from a Different Shore and Saoling Si Wong in her book, Reading Asian American Literature as this very powerful motif for understanding Asian American culture and Asian American politics. And you know, maybe you can explain for the audience what that passage is about before I ask you my, my question about that. Well, you know, I have forgotten about that. What, what I was writing about are, are my mother, my father, my ancestors, and looking at their lives, I saw that so much of what they did was out of necessity, necessity for food, necessity for surviving wars, uh, famines. Uh, they, they went through so much and a lot of what they did was out of necessity. Uh, one thing I learned when I was a kid, it was when I get into a situation that it's hard, just lie. And, uh, and their lives were necessities. Uh, uh, the end. And so I was thinking, uh, I mean, some of the decisions they made were just terrible. And, uh, and, and they, they uh, 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 just trying to save money and not giving us uh, what uh, things that we uh, thought we needed uh, uh, and uh, uh, breaking laws. Uh, and so, uh, it, it, it was a way of looking at, at people's lives and saying, uh, uh, so, sometimes there isn't a choice. This is what one must do. Okay, then uh, 
or writing about extravagance, what comes to mind now is that first story in, uh, uh, in, in the, the Woman Warrior is about my aunt who had an affair or she had a baby out of wedlock. And, and I was thinking that is really extravagant. You know, when, uh, when uh, you are living uh, this life of necessity and hardship and the uh, husband is a man, uh, trying to make a living, uh, you don't go get into an affair. That is such an extravagant thing to do. Or, uh, or my parents, uh, having to buy something for us. Uh, we, we, that's an extravagance. We, we can't afford it. Uh, so that's my thinking in The Woman Warrior <laughs> uh, about mm -hmm. extravagance and necessity. Well, the reason I brought it up in the college of a college uh, context of a college commencement is that I was telling the students and their parents, look, um, obviously we're so focused on necessity and needs, what's important, especially when we're in college and our parents are paying these enormous tuitions or we're paying these enormous tuitions. And while all that is really crucial, I, I also said, you know, but we, we, we need extravagance. You know, I think one of the things that's extravagant is beauty, is art, is writing. That's, I think, sort of implied in, in what you've been saying. Um, adultery, sometimes, maybe, I don't know, but I was talking about art and beauty to, uh, to the graduates. And at the same time, the paradox, and you brought a paradox in one of the sentences that you read, is that extravagance is necessary. We need beauty. We need art. We need writing. We need literature. We need storytelling. And so I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, for me, that's a very important message you try to deliver to, to college students of all backgrounds, but certainly to Asian Americans specifically, who may share some of the same uh, context that you have, or immigrants or refugees, all of whom are driven by necessity for all the reasons that you mentioned. And yet, where would we be as Asian Americans without our writers like yourself? The Woman Warrior has provided so much necessary sustenance for so many readers, Asian American and otherwise. I'm just wondering, you know, The Woman Warrior was published in 76. That was part of the context for it. Would you update necessity and extravagance for today? In any way, I mean, is there, do, you, do you have a sense of what is necessary now versus what is extravagant now? Well, I uh, I can update it just in terms of myself. I find that my own necessities have changed, and um, what's happening right now is that I am. Um, going over a, a, my diary, a diary that I kept. And, uh, and I have, and I, as I'm reading it, I think this is, and I, I kept it in secret because uh, I am so into secrets and telling them, but I, I would write secrets and I wrote freely. And, uh, and but now as I'm reading it, I think, Hey, this is really good. I ought to publish this. And then I think, but what about all these people whose secrets I've told? And uh, so a necessity that I've put on myself is that I am going, to, I am showing what I wrote about people to, to each person that about and uh, and I also tell them that they can change anything, add anything, uh, delete anything. And I find this very difficult uh, because what happens is I am confronting each uh, person, each member of my family, each character, but they're not characters, they're real people. And then, um, uh, and, and then our relationship changes as they 
help me uh, write this. Um, the the, uh, the necessity is that I have made a, uh, a new code of ethics for myself. And uh, when I wrote The Woman Warrior and China Man, I, I, I wrote things about people who, uh, who uh, and I did not tell them. And uh, later I was uh, very wor worried uh, that uh, uh, they would be against what I, I said. And there were things that were mistakes. Uh, there, there's one big uh, mistake going, well, it's not a mistake, but if you remember the story of my bullying of the little girl and uh, when I did a reading in my hometown, Stockton, a uh, big auditorium, uh, many people were there, and I publicly apologized uh, for what I did. And, um, and so uh, since then, I have been thinking, I, I, these people, these people belong to themselves. They don't belong to me or my imagination. And so I have been confronting everybody that I've been writing about and, uh, and going back and forth with them. And I must say, there are some people who do not like what I wrote. Um, okay, extravagance at this point. Um, I am 81 years old and I have written so much and, uh, and my extravagance is to not write. There are days when I say to myself, I don't have to write anything and, uh, and I can do whatever I want. I can accept a dinner invitation I can go to a party uh, and I don't have to write and I don't have to write about it either. Well, I think you've earned the right to be extravagant in any way you, you want to you wanna take it. And of course, you know, necessity and extravagance, as you say, shifts over time. Um, one of the things you mentioned, though, was using writing to confront. Now, one of the, the, one of the ways by which you confronted um, in your writing was not only through your fiction, but through some of your nonfiction too. I think of an essay that's included in the Library of America volume called Cultural Misreadings by American Reviewers, uh, which you wrote in response to some of the responses to The Woman Warrior. And I read that when I was in college. I mean, I read both of The Woman Warrior and the essay. And I thought, wow, the cultural misreadings essay is really powerful because you refuse to back down in the face of these various book reviewers and the way they were taking on your work. And I, I think that that actually was very influential for me because I don't know that we who are writers of color or women writers or so-called minority writers of any background have the luxury of silence in the face of misreading. Now, I know there's one attitude out there that says, well, you know, you publish your book or your artwork and then you leave it to the critics to decide whatever they're going to decide about it. But that sort of assumes that the critics are approaching your work from a shared cultural context. And I think your essay was saying, no, that's, that's not the case. And I'm just wondering, you know, whether you think the cultural context has shifted since cultural misreadings by American reviewers, do you think there are still cultural misreadings of your work taking place or cultural misreadings of work by other women writers or writers of color or Asian American writers? Does your essay or a variation of your essay still need to be written today? I feel that things have changed since the reviews of uh, The Woman Warrior came out. I mean, they were so stereotyped. Uh, and uh, uh, just uh, reviewing uh, my work for what they felt was the correct Chinese uh, 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 exoticism. Or, or, or uh, why don't you have any oranges in your work? Uh, 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 oranges are sacred, uh, uh, and, uh, and reviewing my work as if uh, as if I were a Chinese, and this was a translation. Um, uh, uh, 
even historians uh, would, would just say, oh, you're trying to uh, make your, your peasant family sound good. Uh, oh, here's, here's, uh, here's uh, uh, this, this edition of the uh, woman warrior. On the front, it says nonfiction. And on the back, it says fiction. And uh, so that was a problem that came out when uh, The Woman Warrior was first published. Uh, it was um, in, in, in the UK, all the reviews uh, dealt with what is this? Is this fiction or nonfiction? Uh, and, and there are long essays on the difference between fiction and nonfiction. And uh, it, it reminds me of my uh, first rejection letter. Uh, and it was something like, what is this? This is a pig in a poke. Uh, so what happened in Britain was something just sank because I mean, who cares? A reader, that's not what we read for. <laughs> you, you know, we read for the, the enjoyment, the fun of a book, not, not thinking is this uh, critically, is this a fiction or nonfiction? But what happened in Britain was that um, uh, Sonny Mehta uh, became head of uh, Penguin and, and, uh, and he just took the whole book and reissued it. And, and this was a few years later. And by that time, uh, the, the reviews came out, you know, just reviewing it as a story, uh, as a regular book. Um, the, I, I think nowadays, with ethnic studies, with, uh, with Asian American studies, uh, Black studies, uh, I, I, we're, we're doing much, much better. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, one of my friends recently uh, did a little survey to see how many Asian American literary works have been published since 2020. I think the list was like approaching 200 books. When I was in your seminar at Berkeley, which was about 1990, I think a, a new book by an Asian American would come out every year, perhaps, if we were lucky. And so I would just freak out and run to the, the university bookstore and get the new book by, by David Wong Louie or, or you know, Jessica Hagedorn. And now literally it's like every week there's a new book out there. So there has been a real transformation with the number of voices uh, that Asian Americans and many others now have. Now, on your, on your point, though, about the, the, the inability of readers back in 1976, to, uh, some readers, to make sense out of what was going on in The Woman Warrior, it reminds me, of, and the fact that this it's both nonfiction and fiction, reminds me of the fact that you are many decades ahead of your time, because one of the hot literary categories now is autofiction. Yes. You know, like, oh, the fiction that is totally based on an author's life, using an author's name, and we can't tell what's, what's autobiography and what's fiction. And a lot of this autofiction is is, you know, very uh, apolitical, I think, you know, and, you know, as written, you know, honestly by white people. And yet I think about you and I think about another writer we could classify in the Asian American tradition as an autofiction writer, Carlos Bulasan. And mm -hmm. while the works are deeply personal, they're also deeply political as well. Um, so, you know, congratulations on inaugurating a field or helping to inaugurate a field in the Asian American tradition where necessity and extravagance are brought together. Absolutely necessary to talk about our history and ourselves, but also absolutely extravagant to render it through art and not only through autobiography. Now, you're, we, we, there's a lot of discussion, obviously, about The Woman Warrior, which is a classic of American literature, but I want to talk a little bit about another book that you wrote, Tripmaster Monkey, which I had read when it came out, I believe it was about 1991. And I was a little confused in 1991 because I was very young, but also because there was so much happening in this book. And I reread re it recently. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is actually one of our first great Asian American novels in the sense that it is like the great American novel, an ambitious novel that tries to tell the, you know, the whole story of America or Asian America through one particular narrative. So this is a really fun novel. It's a loving history and a satire of Asian American emergence in the 1960s. Stars a character named Whitman, 
uh, Singh, which is clearly a reference to Walt Whitman, but also to, a, as you read the book, it's also, he's, a, he's, a, he's an allusion to many other Asian American literary figures, including uh, your, your rival, if I could put it that way, Frank Chin, and maybe others. And there's so many references to Asian American literature, literary history, the Eaton sisters, Chang and Eng, Carlos Bulosan, Jade Snow Wong, and so on and so forth. And it was an influential novel uh, for me in a way that I probably didn't realize because when I wrote my novel, The Sympathizer, I alluded to Chipmaster Monkey without even being aware of it. Anyway, I want you, if you could, to read a passage from Chipmaster Monkey. I put it in your private chat, if you could pull it up. And then I have a question for you about Tripmaster Monkey from Professor Rob Wilson of uh, UC Santa Cruz, who I asked to help me out by, by contributing a few questions today, since I knew we had three conversations together and I was running out of ideas myself. So if you could read that, and then I'll give you Rob's question. Yes. How do I do that? Or, or I have the book here, if you could tell me what page it's on. Uh, do you see, there should be a chat thing at the bottom of your it says chat. Yes, click on that. I sent you a chat. Oh, yes. oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, it says, okay, here is, here is Whitman's Classless Society. Is that what you? Oh, would you like me to read that? Please. Okay. Okay. And I put it into everybody's chat so they can read along. Okay. Here we are, Walt Whitman's classless society of everyone who could read or be read to. Will one of these listening passengers please write to the city council and suggest that there always be a reader on this route? Whitman Ah Singh has begun a someday tradition that may lead to a job as a reader riding the railroads through the West, on the train through Fresno, Sororian through the Salinas Valley, Steinbeck through Monterey Bay, Cannery Row along the Big Sur Ocean, Jack Kerouac on the way to Weed of Mice and Men, and all of the Central Valley on the Southern Pacific with migrant Carlos Bulosan, America is in the heart. What a repertoire, a lifetime reading job. You don't easily come home, come back to San Francisco Chinatown where they give you stink eye and call you a Sang, sang Su Lo, a whisker growing man, beatnik. Oh gosh, I forgot all about that. I forgot all about that. It does make me realize how big I was writing because I, I just wanted to do all of America, uh, not just Chinese American writing, but uh, American writing, where it all comes from. And uh, wow. <laughs> all of your books are hugely ambitious. Um, and, uh, and, and it's, it's probably not a surprise that you can't remember every single sentence you wrote from all of these books over the years. But here's uh, Rob Wilson's question about this uh, particular presence of Walt Whitman. Could you discuss this impact of Walt Whitman on your Chinese American character, Whitman as Singh, and or more broadly, on your vision of America? Well, my, my idea of, uh, of writing about America was uh, to do America in the 60s. And, uh, and, and the reason was that I was a, a, a young person in the 60s. And I just thought it was the most wonderful time. And uh, it was, uh, a, a time when, when the mind went psychedelic and there were all these wonderful ideals of democracy and community and, uh, and art and music, uh, uh, amazing language, the slang of that time, uh, the, the vision of how it's possible uh, 
to, to live and how to end war uh, and how to live in peace, all of that. And, and so I wanted to write a, uh, a, a story of, of that time and the way I uh, felt and lived it. And, uh, and in it, I would put my friends uh, the, uh, who, and, and, uh, the, uh, and, and what we did and, and the, the, the music, the dancing. Uh, and I also wanted to write fiction because um, I had written Woman Warrior and Chinaman and uh, 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 clearly not uh, made up. And, uh, and I uh, thought that I was a very, uh, I was not a good writer. I, I'm not a novelist at all. So let me see whether I can write something that's not real. Uh, also, there were secrets that I wanted to hide. And, um, and well, why don't I just tell them, but I'll just call it fiction, such as hiding uh, AWOL soldiers during the, the war. And, uh, and, and if, if it was, if those circumstances came again, I, I want to be able to hide people again, but I don't want anybody to know. So, so I, I just made Whitman do it. Um, I, I call them Whitman uh, because uh, the, uh, I wanted him to be uh, like Walt Whitman, the poet, and, uh, and, and singing America. And uh, so I named him a Whitman, but spelled it wrong. Because and uh, and then I sing. Of course, it's I uh, I sing the body electric, but also it comes from Bret Hart and 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 uh, Mark Twain, who called their Chinamen. They they their last they they were called I sing. So, uh, so I thought, well, I'll give him that name too. Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the naming your character Whitman after Walt Whitman reminds me of the fact that I had uh, Chinese or Taiwanese American friends who were named Wilson and Bonaparte, presumably after the major political figures, right? And yes. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if, they, if their parents or other parents had named their kids after great writers or, or great artists instead of the, the, the presidents and yeah. the generals? Well, you named your son Ellison. Right. I think that's wonderful. But I think we're explaining because unfortunately, not every, most people don't make the connection between Ellison and Ralph Ellison. Whereas if I were to name my son Hemingway, people are like, oh yeah, Hemingway, you know? So, but of course I don't want to do that. <laughs> now, um, I also see your naming your son Ellison as our honoring the, uh, the black writers who have so influenced us and so helped us out to, uh, you know, they paved the way and we just came right in that door too. No, absolutely. Um, I, I'm gonna ask you another question from, from Rob Wilson from UC Santa Cruz and, and uh, weave in another one from another audience member. So, you know, you spent time in Hawaii, actually many years in Hawaii, and I believe you wrote The Woman Warrior while you were in Hawaii, right? You left Berkeley. And then you and uh, Earl, your husband, went to, to Hawaii, partly to get away from the war climate of the United States. I think you taught there in Hawaii, and then you wrote The Woman Warrior while you were there. Now, The Woman Warrior uh, explicitly refers to talk story, and this is, this is uh, Rob's question. Talk story is a pidgin English term used in Hawaii. <laughs> Here he has a, a line from pidgin. I'm just going to read it in English. You like talk story about that? You have taken this... <laughs> I'm not going to offend people by, by trying to say that in pigeon. You have taken this term talk story and used it in Woman Warrior and elsewhere. Can you talk about some words or values and other influence you took from your years of living and teaching in Hawaii? Were, were they influential for you? 
And one of the audience members has a very similar question. So I just want to call out John Simons from Honolulu, who also wants to know about the um, impact of Hawaii uh, on your writing. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. Aloha, everybody from Hawaii. But it, what happened uh, when I was writing Woman Warrior in Hawaii, I was, I was thinking uh, of the Chinese term, gong gu jai. And, uh, and I'm writing about uh, my mother and, and, uh, and the, the people around me, gong gu jai. And, uh, and I was thinking, how am I, what, how can I translate that into English? And, uh, and there it was, right in everywhere in Hawaii, talk story that is the literal translation of gongbu jai and um uh, and and so it it was right there for me to pick up and and it fits it, it fits entirely the same tradition that we have in uh china and hawaii uh passing on orally history, myth, uh, uh, just, just everyday life. It, it, it's alive in Hawaii. The uh, uh, children, children talk story. Uh, we come, oh, this happened when I was writing Woman Warrior. I was watching the news and uh, somebody, uh, somebody had committed a crime and uh, the the police had hold of him, and the reporter asked, uh, "Oh, is he under arrest?" And and the cop said, "Nah, we just bring him in to talk story." <laughs> so it, it, it's, it, but but in a way, when people talk story in Hawaii, they they give it a form, you know, they 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 tell it in a way that it's entertaining and, uh, and, uh, and, and traumatic. And uh, so th that whole tradition um, uh, just came together uh, for me uh, in Hawaii. Uh, also, uh, another way that Hawaii influenced me a lot uh, is, um, you know, all of that, uh, the, the Vietnam War was taking place at that time. We lived right across from, um, we, we lived right on Kaneohe Bay. You could see the planes take off uh, every, all the time, taking off from the Kaneohe Marine Corps Air Station, heading for Vietnam. And, and then there was that peace movement at the Church of the Crossroads. And that was when we were hiding the AWOL, uh, 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 the AWOL soldiers. And, uh, and so uh, I, I have tried to write that. And, uh, and also uh, the, uh, the whole feeling of, of aloha and the air and the people and the, the way they re relate to one another, which is, uh, and, and the contradictory way of, uh, of, of giving aloha and love, but also uh, being mean to one another. Uh, I, I, I try to put all of that in there. And also it helped me a lot to hear accents, uh, English accents, because uh, it's all, all the people, of the, the different kinds of people that are in Hawaii uh, speak English with a different kind of accent. And, uh, and I was trying to pick that up to do my, my Chinese accent or Hawaiian accent and, and, and trying to, um, you know, it, it, it's even different from generation to generation. So uh, 
So the older people speak, speak English this way and the younger that way and, and all of that uh, influenced uh, my writing. Right. Um, we have time for a couple, at least a couple of questions from the audience, I think, or one or two questions. Uh, here's a question from Cynthia Dye of East Boston in Massachusetts. Did any of your books take a turn you didn't expect when you began? I think that all of it is taking turns unexpected all the time. I, uh, I am not a person who writes an outline. I have no plot in mind. I don't know where I'm going. And uh, I just make the road as I go along. And it's like, uh, I, I, I write a sound or a word and then the next one comes and then the next one um, and uh, and all of a sudden, uh, a, a, a whole uh, idea or scene or person enters, and and uh, and I don't know where I'm going until I get there. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, yeah. It's all a surprise. Um. One more question from the audience, and that is from uh, Greg Scully, who's from Canada. Doesn't say we're in Canada, just all Canada. Sure, sure, Greg. Uh, comment on the relationship between memory and mythology in your works. Wow, memory and mythology. Hmm. Hmm. I, I can think that uh, memory, well, you know, a couple of times, there have been times in my life when I uh, have seen a former incarnation and uh, I have seen myself as a uh, as a man living in China. Um, but I don't know whether that's memory or whether it's real or whether it's a dream. Um, the, uh, the, I wrote the sections on Falmoglan last. Uh, I had, I had completed the woman warrior, uh, just telling the, the everyday stories of being in school and so on. And, um, but then when I finished uh, that, I, I felt that as each draft, as I wrote each draft, I could see further and I could uh, but perspective change. I could see further in time and in space. Uh, and, um, and then somehow the, uh, I guess it's memory. Uh, I, I, I heard the sound, chick, chick, chick. And that was, it, it was my mother when I was just first learning to talk, she would give me the chant of Fa Mugan, which began like that. I had forgotten all about it. And somehow it came. And so is it, uh, is, is this like a, a universal memory that I, that uh, I, I don't know. Is it memory? Is it magic? Is it, uh, or, or, oh, oh, here's an, another thing. <laughs> you know, there's no explanation for this stuff. At the end of The Woman Warrior, I have the uh, barbarians fighting and they are making 
they are making uh, arrows and they're and they can make arrows out of flutes and they can make flutes into arrows and as the arrows uh, take off uh, they, 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 they can make sounds and music and um, so I was sure that I invented that and I, I just made it up uh, okay years go by and I am in Xi'an and I find a dusty little museum and um, and and there under a, a dusty glass case and labeled of about a thousand years ago is an arrow made out of made a flute arrow, and there it is. And what what went through my mind as I looked at it was, I made it up, and I caused it to appear a thousand years ago. Oh, you know, that reminds me of um, of part of the. Uh, the poem I wrote, uh, uh, the uh, I love a broad margin to my life. Uh, in that poem, I write about Chinese time, and uh, there is a a myth or an idea in Chinese poetry that uh, if you write. It, uh, a poet can be totally satisfied as one reader and uh, and if you just have one reader you you're happy and that's as good as getting published and this reader can come a thousand years from now uh, so maybe that was how I caused the arrow to appear. Also, your reader can, uh, uh, you, you could uh, be uh, a thousand years ago, maybe somebody thought of you and then that's how you appear in writing. Okay. I think that is very abstract, but I think I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my question. It was a great conversation. And I have to remind people in the audience, this is a part two of three conversations Maxine and I are having. I put into the, the chat for everybody our next event, which is on June 8th with the Free Library of Philadelphia. It will be virtual, so you can call in from anywhere. And I promise I will ask different questions than I did today, so we'll get some different answers from Maxine and I'll try to get in. <laughs> I wasn't able to get to. Thanks so much, Maxine. Thank you, Via, and thank you, everybody. Thank you both very much. It was fantastic. You guys were just kind of just kind of getting warmed up there. And in fact, there's a ton of great questions that have just come in, which I guess they'll have to forward to the Philadelphia event or the other events that are that are coming. Anyway, that was fantastic. Uh, really great. Um, and uh, um, you've been listening to Maxine Han Kingston discuss her life and work with, work with Viet Thanh Nguyen. Her writing has just been published in the Library of America in The Woman Warrior, Chinaman, Tripmaster Monkey, and Other Writings, a volume number 355 in the Library of America series. Please join us for forthcoming events from Library of America. On Wednesday, June 1st, acclaimed poet and best-selling champion for poetry, Edward Hirsch, joins us to discuss The Heart of American Poetry, his revelatory and deeply moving new book about the poems that have changed his life and how our poetic tradition is at its heart a passionate conversation about American democracy. Details about this and other upcoming LOA Live events can be found on our website, LOA.org, where you'll also find information about Library of America's Maxine Hong Kingston volume, about The Heart of American Poetry, and links to purchase those and other editions of Great American Writing. 
You'll also find recordings of tonight's and previous LOA live events. Thanks so much again to Maxine and Viet for a terrific, lively, wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, and I hope you all have a great evening.